Sweetheart, you have we to sit over there. Have some water, please? Because there's somebody else first. All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to the um, May 20th, 2015 meeting of the Milton School Committee. Before we get started, if everyone could uh, rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Um, we uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the May 20th, 2015 agenda. Any um, any additions, subtractions to the agenda? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Now we move to citizen speak. Uh, we have a number of um, um, uh, uh, citizens who have signed up for citizen speak, and given that, I just thought I would remind um, the citizens, since there are a number of them, of a couple of the points in our policy on public participation. Uh, one of the points is that generally uh, citizen speak shall not exceed 15 minutes unless it is extended by the chair, and it shall not exceed 30 minutes except by a vote of the majority of the committee. Uh, another uh, provision of our policy is that speakers will be allowed up to three minutes to present their material, although again the chair may extend this time limit and that uh, speakers may offer opinions of school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear any personal complaints about any member of the uh, school committee, uh, school community. Um, all remarks in Citizen Speak shall be uh, addressed to the chair, and um, uh, generally speaking, because of the, um, uh, the need for deliberation and policy making <coughs> and input from many sources, committee members do not generally um, respond on the spot to the citizen's remarks. However, if a committee member feels compelled to make a <coughs> statement after a citizen speak, he or she, he or she may do that, uh, and that generally should not exceed more than a minute. So uh, that's just a few of the provisions of our public petition patient policy. Try saying that three times fast. Um, so uh, with that, we will proceed to our first citizen speak participant, and I believe it's Reverend Hall Kirkham. I hope I pronounced your name right, Reverend? Like city. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Hall Kirkham, and I am the rector at St. Michael's Episcopal Church in Milton, uh, still newish rector, and I'm also the chair of the Milton Interfaith Clergy Association. And I am delighted to be here, uh, Chairperson Zulis. Thank you for having this. Um, I won't be able to stay for the whole meeting because I have to get home and make dinner. And the longer I wait, the more snacks my kids eat. Um, so I am um, here to make a comment on the recent decision to expand the school calendar in the coming year by converting Yom Kippur and Good Friday into school days. Um, such a major decision seemed to have uh, little input from the town behind it beyond the circulation of a one-time survey to parents, which I honestly missed in my carelessness, the day it came out in the superintendent's blog, but I offer four thoughts. Uh, first, it seems to me that a more open exchange of ideas and discussion than we had could yield productive ideas for adding days, like using half days or choosing other default holidays like uh, Christmas Eve or the day before Thanksgiving, or any of the options other communities are pursuing or even by favoring <clears throat> no religious holidays at all in the calendar and letting religious individuals elect the days they want to take off. Second, I believe you're holding Yom Kippur and Good Friday as equal offerings for the new calendar is a dramatically asymmetric solution. Given that Yom Kippur is the holiest day in the Jewish calendar and on par with Christmas celebrations of Easter, Christian celebrations of Easter or Christmas in its significance. Easter, of course, is protected as a Sunday event, and Christmas is protected as a federal holiday. This past year's weather, compared even with the previous six years, could very well be once in a generation experience for snow days. One of the past six years, I understand, had no snow days, and one year we lost days of school due to a single major hurricane. Finally, I understand that there was considerable pressure expressed by some folks that something you know, something must be done to avoid the school year creeping into June, which could unwittingly establish a precedent for pushing change through isolated lobbying rather than through a thoughtful process of discernment. So my hope and the hope of the clergy in the town of Milton is that we have a chance to discuss openly and with care any decisions that involve singling out of particular religious holidays in order to provide for more calendar school days. 
Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Kirk. <coughs> Next on the list is Karen Friedman. Hannah. Good evening. I am Karen Friedman Hanna, and I am both a past parent of children in the schools. My kids have both graduated. Um, and I'm also the president of Congregation Beth Shalom of the Blue Hills. Um, I'm going to say a couple of comments from as each of those uh, perspectives. Um, first, as a parent, when my kids were going through the schools, they had rush, uh, Yom Kippur off when it fell during the week. But if it didn't fall during the week, it was on a weekend, they didn't have Rosh Hashanah off, typically. And my kids were, um, I had one who was a super overachiever and one who was extremely bright, but not so much an overachiever. And, but they both had the same perspective that when it came time to making the decision of taking the holiday off, if it wasn't given to them, they both felt they didn't want to miss school, that they were missing so much, even if the policy was no tests, no major events going on, well, I can't say major events, but no tests or quizzes were supposed to not happen on the holiday. Mm -hmm. But they always had assignments that they needed to make up. They always knew that classes were moving on regardless of whether they were in school or not. And it became an issue later on in their career, as high schoolers especially, but even a little bit in middle school, when it became a family discussion of which is the more important thing to you that you do. And we had to let them make that decision a lot of the time because they, they knew what they were going to be up against. And it was painful to have to make that decision as a parent to either choose your faith, the religion, the very, very significant holiday, or to go to school and potentially miss things that you knew were going to be very important. And we always instilled in our kids how important school was. We were extremely active in all ways with, with their entire education process, and we never, ever took it lightly to have them miss a day of school. Their attendance was excellent. They, were, they both did great through the schools. So I caution you to, to have as a perspective that well, so they won't have anything major happening that day, and you can choose to take the day off if you'd like, because the kids really are then put into a very significant quandary of what to do, and they have to make up everything that they've missed in one way or another. And it's not as easy as it may seem, especially in the later years. Now, from a temple president perspective, I'm, I'm not speaking for my whole congregation. I did not poll everybody in the congregation to get their views on this, and so I don't feel comfortable speaking for them, although several people are here from the congregation who have kids in the school. But I will tell you that, as you know, I hope you know, that our new synagogue is being built as we speak, and we're hoping that it's going to be fully constructed within the year, hopefully by next spring. And even without having our building and us being kind of nomads right now and, and housed in different places, in the past year, we've had almost 20 new families join our synagogue. Now that should tell you something about the interest in Judaism in our town, and that's before we have our synagogue up and standing. So we've had many inquiries, people telling us that they are interested in knowing what's happening, and there is the potential that this will be a draw for young Jewish families to move to Milton to have a new synagogue in town. People ask us if the town is Jewish friendly. I have always said yes, the town is very Jewish friendly. I hope that we can continue that being a concept and an understanding that just because there aren't that that many Jews in the town that as a respectful issue it's important to recognize the most significant day in our um, religious year so thank you for your consideration thank you Karen um, next on the list is uh, Emily Goldman Hi. 
Hi, my name is Emily Goldman, and I am the mother of a first grader at Glover, and I'm also a member of the Temple. Um, it's, my understand, it's my understanding that members of the PTO at various schools reported to Superintendent Gormley earlier this week that they had informally surveyed parents about the decision to eliminate y the Yom Kippur and Good Friday holidays in order to bank additional snow days, and based on their survey, they reported that most parents supported eliminating these holidays. I'd just like to say, first of all, that nobody contacted me to ask me my opinion. I did send a letter to the PTO presidents, and following my letter, I ran into one of the parents and had a discussion, but nobody initiated a conversation with me to try to find out my view. Um, I feel very strongly that Yom Kippur should be a school holiday, and I'll explain why. Um, as some of what I will say repe repeats what others have said, but I think it, it still warrants saying. This past winter was, I, ho I think we all hope, an anomaly. And although I know that the huge number of snow days wrought havoc with the teaching schedule as well as working parents' schedules, it seems an, a very extreme reaction to decide to eliminate Yom Kippur, the Yom Kippur holiday in particular uh, based on a single really horrible season. Um, the tradition of giving students the Yom Kippur holiday in this town is goes back many decades, and this tradition should be continued as a show of respect <coughs> for the important contributions that Milton's diverse religious communities have made to life in this town and continue to make to life in this town. When the initial decision was made to eliminate these holidays, it appeared that a relatively few, relatively few parents had weighed in on the survey with their preferences. It appears that once again a decision is being made based on insufficient information and with insufficient input from the community at large. Many of those who may favor the elimination of the holiday, the Yom Kippur holiday, may not be aware that it's the holiest day of the year, parallel to Christmas and Easter in importance, um, as has been said earlier. Indeed, even many non-observant Jewish families make it a priority to observe this holiday either on their own or by spending the day in the synagogue, and in many instances by fasting for 24 hours. Although Jewish students represent a relatively small percentage of the Milton public school population, the Jewish community in Milton is vibrant and appears to be growing, <coughs> as indicated by our temple president. We're very excited about this, and we'd like to make these new members feel as welcome in town as we can, and this is one show of welcoming people into town. The past recognition by the Milton Public Schools of the importance of this holiday with a school holiday, excuse me, of Yom Kippur with a school holiday has sent a strong message of support to members of the Jewish community in town, and the as will the continued recognition of this holiday. I recognize that it's hard to find ways to increase the number of bank snow days and that you've all worked very hard to try to figure out how to make this happen. Nonetheless, the elimination of school holidays on such an important religious day is simply not an acceptable solution. Although I know it's hard to, make, to find an option that makes everybody happy, or maybe even that might even be impossible, more viable options would be to eliminate a day that's not a holiday, or a shortened day that's not a holiday, like the day before or after Thanksgiving, um, the day before Christmas, or to shorten one of the two winter vacations to a long weekend. In conclusion, I'm, I'm requesting that Yom Kippur remain a school holiday as a main, means of recognizing and showing respect for the diversity that makes and will continue to make Milton a great place for families with school-aged children, school children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goldman. Um, it, 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 it appears that we're coming up to our 15-minute um, limit. Uh, however, I uh, will exercise the discretion that I have to extend it by another 15 minutes. Um, and um, these children here. Okay, I'm sorry, Maura. Should this person be next? Doesn't matter. Okay. All right. So I'm going to use my discretion to extend it another 15 minutes. If we have to proceed more than that, then it would take a school committee vote. So next on the list is Rob Milt, Mr. Milt. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Rob Milt. I am a parent of three children. Uh, uh, our daughter is in a second grader at Glover, and we have a pair of boys who will be entering into the school system in the fall of 2016. 
Um, I'm a town meeting member and I'm also a member of the uh, Temple Beth Shalom of the Blue Hills. Um, I've worked in government and you know politics for nearly almost 20 years now and I find that government works best when a uh, problem is identified and a solution is carefully deliberated by the elected body um, and it seemed that things moved very quickly uh, a month or so ago when uh, the decision was made and I f it, it seems as though uh, that it was a, a solution seeking a problem and I f believe that you should spend some additional time considering uh, this um, this decision I believe certainly that Yom Kippur should stay as part of the school calendar um, and um, provide the, you know, and, and seek out the, the opinion from the, the uh, uh, town population, for the school, the, the parents of the, of the, uh, in the school system. Um, it's certainly good, certainly reach out to PTO uh, heads, um, but I think it's also, and also to reach out via uh, various informal surveys. Um, but I would encourage you to perhaps, you know, perhaps appoint a subcommittee or appoint a special committee to study, study this issue of how to properly bank snow days um, or to what is the right amount um, and um, it's it's a shame that the 40 year nearly 40 year tradition of removing Yom Kippur from the school holiday calendar um, occurred it seemed quick it seemed perhaps rash um, but that is my my opinion um, I don't also add that it's um, um, it's a ref whatever is decided it's really a reflection on the uh, school's commitment to diversity and its c commitment to inclusion um, it's true well the Jewish population is small I think it is mighty and active in the town um, and I I know that uh, back in the 1940s when the temple was founded here in Milton it um, there were Jews who came out of Mattapan and Jews who came out of uh, other parts of Boston. They came from what they called, and not probably a little bit pejorative, but Jew Hill Avenue. Um, and they, I in part, helped found the temple. And I, you know, can only help think about the next generation of people who moved to this town for the schools, for the quality of life, and how very important it is um, for us to embrace them, embrace those children um, in the same way that the town embraced uh, the Jewish population, uh, I suppose now seven, 70 years ago, when I, I believe, as, as, it been, as it's been described to me, it was actually called a Hebrew con uh, it wasn't actually able, we weren't actually able to call it a temple, I think it was something called a Hebrew congregation, because it was not considered quite politically correct to have Jews move to town, but I, it's, um, um, it's a, it's a, a, a weighty matter you're considering, or will I hope you will reconsider? I should say, um, and I guess I would, you know, I was thinking about all of this in the uh, historical context, and how um, George Washington wrote to the Hebrew congregation back in 1790 down in, in Newport, and said, "If we have the wisdom to make the best use of the advantages for which we are now favor, we cannot fail under the just administration of good government um, to become a great." and uh, happy people. So uh, I guess with that, I will, I will leave you. And so thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you Rob. Um, next, uh, we have um, Deborah Mobauer. <coughs> you like children to be Hi. waiting. I'm going to make sure the rabbi has time, so I don't want to take his time. Are we going to run out of time? I, if, if, I'll, I'll give you enough. I'll, I think the committee will probably give you the time. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Deborah Milbauer, and I'm a parent of a second grader at Glover and a parent of a sixth grader at Pierce, um, but I'm also a Temple member. Um, however, I'm also speaking on behalf of a lot of my friends. I have m many friends who live in Milton who are Jewish, who either belong to other temples and synagogues in other towns. Um, or who are Jewish and are unaffiliated. So there's sort of a range of families that I'm speaking on behalf of. 
um, who I've spoken to and they've given me permission to speak on their behalf. So thank you so much. Um, I'll just bullet all the things that I'd like to say instead of reading it because everybody has said it previous to me very eloquently. Um, the first is that Yom Kippur is the most sacred holiday of the entire year for the Jewish community. Um, and to be taking it away feels like a blow and that the Jewish community isn't being honored um, or respected because of this policy change. So it really feels like a blow. It's not some objective policy change. This is emotional um, and feels really serious to me and it feels like um, it's a personal injury to take away the most sacred day of the entire Jewish year. Now, all families honor it differently, um, but regardless, it is the most sacred day. And frankly, as someone said earlier, I think the equivalent, I know you guys were trying to be equitable, so you're saying, all right, we'll take Yom Kippur, we'll also take um, Good Friday, but it would be more um, comparable to say we'll take Christmas. And I know Christmas is a federally protected holiday, but putting the federal holiday aside, how would it feel if we said, you know what, we just want to get out a couple of days earlier in June and, you know, we've got vacations to go to and so we're going to take Christmas away. So that's sort of what it feels like. I know your intent is not to be hurtful or not to marginalize any community. I know that's not your intent, but that's how it feels. Um, missed instruction can't be made up. So I know a lot of people say, all right, just pull your kids out of school. That's fine. You have the right to do that. But it penalizes the Jewish kids because you can't make up missed instruction. Um, as one teacher told me, it also forces them to take a personal day, which isn't really fair of asking of the teachers and also if administrative staff has to go, then you have to pull in subs and temps or the folks left manning the desk has to have to do double the work. So there's sort of issues on the administrative side also. Long-term policy change should not be based on one historically bad winter. Somebody else already talked about that. It also feels like vacation is being given as a priority over um, a Jewish holiday. Um, I understand it gets complicated when we get late into the year. But it's rushing to take vacation or rushing to send the kids to summer camp. It just doesn't feel like that should be the priority. If we really have to weigh, it feels like that's not a compelling enough argument because you have to, we want to go to vacation earlier. Um, people have already talked about this, but the e-blast is a terrific opportunity to talk in depth about all the details that are going on. I love reading about students that won this award and lots of great information, but frankly, I often don't have a chance to read it a lot, even though it's a great tool. Um, six, I'm told that about 6,000 people are on the e-blast list. 72% um, voted yes and 29% voted no to change the policy. However, when I teased out the numbers, um, the Milton Times reported that 367 people responded yes and 144 people responded no. This means that 6% of those to whom the e-blast was sent voted in favor of eliminating the holidays and 2% voted to keep them. So this is a very low response rate. Um, when the school wants to communicate really important things to me, I get an email from the principal. When I was asked, or, or a flyer in the backpack, I mean, there's multiple avenues to reach really busy families who work full time, who are shuttling kids to activities and sports. And it's, it's unrealistic to expect that everyone is going to read the e-blast, even though it's chock full and it's awesome. It's really long and it's really hard to get to it. And most families I know say, yeah, it's great. I wish I'd read it, but I just didn't have time. Um, so um, in terms of the process, I really was very disturbed by the process. So I'm asking you all to reconsider, just in terms of process, um, maybe convene a study committee to pull together a group of representatives, parents, teachers, um, 
a, a range of voices to sort of work on this and study what do other communities do? What are the options? People made really good suggestions about different options. So I'd like, I'm asking the committee to reconsider and if, um, and or convene a study committee because I think it needs to be thoughtful and carefully worked out. Um, lastly, I was disturbed to hear, I was grateful to hear that the superintendent met with the heads of the PTOs. I thought that was great and I, I appreciated that you afforded them that opportunity. Um, I was told that four out of the six PTO heads came and that the result was that only, the PTO heads reported that only one parent was opposed to the, to the policy change. Which isn't true, because I know of four or five parents I know of spoke to the PTO head at Clever. We all talked to her. We all talked to each other about talking to her. I don't know if she was there or not that night. I actually haven't had a chance to find out. And there was only four out of the six, so two whole schools weren't represented. And it just really concerns me that there was no survey sent around. These, the PTO heads are busy parents also. Um, we weren't reached out to, you know, the traffic study survey, I got Facebook and email and the backpack and like 12 different ways I saw the traffic survey. I did not see one single communication other than the e-blast, which I saw after the decision had been made because I went back and looked. So I just wanted to, I'm ending now, I'm just going to read a list of names of <coughs> families who are in the Milton Public School System who are opposed to this policy change, um, whose who were not represented in that PTO committee meeting um, with Superintendent Gormley. Um, all of these folks gave me permission to put their name on this list and read their names so you have an understanding of just how many families are opposed to this. Because I get the sense that the way the survey was done and the meeting from the PTO, you don't really have a sense of how many families really are very opposed. So on my list are Jessica Rader, Irina Ehrenberg, Jeff Kosiba, Robert and Denise Lazoff, Kelly and Eben Lenz, Deb Savona, uh, Claudia Green and Mike Massey, Liz Schwartz, Lisa Paracone, Joanne Lloyd, Hillary Farber, and Joanna Weiss, and folks who are here in this room, Rob Milt, Emily Goldman, Karen Friedman, Hannah, and many others. So I just want to leave on this note. Um, I really hope that this committee will honor the diversity of this community as reflected in reconsidering this policy change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. Um, we have um, two more names on the list, and uh, I leave it to you. We have uh, uh, Rabbi Benjamin and uh, Father McGlo McLaughlin, and uh, so I leave it to you uh, which order you'd like to come in. I hate the kids having to wait. So I have a chart of our it's up editor. There school districts. It's also up here. I hope uh, people on uh, TV land can see this. I'm uh, Rabbi Fred Benjamin. I'm a uh, resident of Milton. And if you take a look at our uh, comparable, in, in many of the cases, comparable school districts, what I have here is a chart that says the name of the town on the left, Rosh Hashanah Day 1, then Yom Kippur, Good Friday, others, issues, and last day of school. And a couple things I'd like you to take a look at when you look at these schools, Westwood, Lexington, Newton, Arlington, Hingham, Quincy, and Canton, is that in each case, they do recognize one, at least one religious holiday, even if it's in the case of uh, Quincy, where there's no school on Good Friday. Quincy, I think, had an outrageous number of uh, more than us. Hingham had more than us this last year. By the way, notice no school has more than five days banked, even after last year. None have chosen more than five. I could not find any school district that banked more than five days, and we're banking seven. Uh, and look at the dates. They're all pretty comparable. Hingham is, uh, uh, and Westwood are the outliers. But take a look at how they did that, where it says other, the day before Thanksgiving is a half day. The, the Wednesday before uh, Christmas, not only Thursday off, this year, uh, Friday is Christmas, they have a half day uh, on school for Wednesday. So they've used half days in very clever ways. So these are our competitors. These are, are the schools that we say we want to be as good as them. And uh, it really is shocking that we're the only one that's banked seven days. Thank you.
Thank you, Rabbi Benjamin. Uh, we have one uh, one final speaker. We we have hit our 30 minutes, so I, so I would like to just move that we extend the session beyond 30, 30 minutes uh, for our last speaker. Um, do I have a second on the motion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Um, and so our last speaker is uh, uh, Father Patrick uh, McLaughlin. Good evening, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Father Pat McLaughlin. I'm presently living at St. Agatha's Rectory. I retired from uh, St. Joseph's in Medford um, three years ago, after 36 years there. And the new pastor going to come to St. Agatha's is from the neighboring parish in Medford. So I think Medford's trying to take over Milton, so be careful. <laughs> I appreciate the time that you folks offer us to uh, share our thoughts, uh, but I do want to comment on the proposal that uh, the Medford clergy presented on, under the, hand, the handwriting of uh, Rabbi Benjamin, just to make a clarification so we we'll see where we're coming from. Uh, Easter is the most sacred uh, celebration of the Christian faith. Jesus rose from the dead, that's our belief. Christmas gets a big hand because the baby was born on Christmas Day and it's a sentimental attachment to little babies and the whole bit. But actually, in the scheme of things, Jesus said there's no greater love that anyone has than to lay down his life for his neighbor. And on Good Friday, Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. So Friday... Good Friday is a very important day to the Christian community. We believe that crucifixion started around 12 o'clock and uh, ended around 3. I, I think that's what I want to say about clarification of the importance of Good Friday, which uh, somebody who was not of the Christian faith might not appreciate uh, as well as others. I would wonder, uh, is it possible? I do agree with the rabbi that we should consider it seriously maintaining the, the holy day of Yom Kippur. Uh, but I also make the suggestion that, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for the Medford clergy, I'm not speaking for the Cardinal of Boston, I'm speaking for myself. Uh, I would suggest the possibility of uh, having a half day on Good Friday, and that would allow the calendar to be maintained, yet would allow the children a those parents who want to participate in some type of more solemn ser service on Good Friday would have the opportunity to do so. Am I clear? Any <laughs> questions? Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Um, let, me, let me say this, um, just because I feel compelled to say something. Um, the, uh, the school committee deliberated and voted on this on April 1st. Um, it is not, I believe, good practice to um, revisit issues that have been deliberated and voted on um, with frequency and soon after they've been deliberated and voted on. This would be within really a couple of months. However, uh, if there is additional or different information or perspectives that the school committee didn't have uh, access to at the time of those deliberations. And um, it is logistically fe feasible uh, in that the, um, the, um, there's no bar in terms of logistics to revisiting the decision. It seems to me in those circumstances um, that um, revisiting the issue is warranted. So um, it is my intention to include a discussion of this issue on the agenda at our next meeting, which is June 10th. Um, and at that time, we'll have the opportunity to discuss, and any member will have the opportunity, if they wish, to make a motion. Um, now, you may say, well, Mike, we're all here. Why don't we discuss it tonight? Um, and, and the answer is just to let the public know how we do things. Uh, by policy, we send out our agendas three days before, generally on the Friday before. 
This gives the committee the opportunity to review materials and uh, ruminate on things, and so they can be well armed to discuss and decide on issues. Um, and so um, I think that's appropriate in this case, uh, and so um, so I think it's appropriate to uh, to uh, to wait and to include it on uh, on the agenda for June 10th. So that's what uh, that's what I intend to do. Okay. Anything else else for ci uh, citizen speak? No? All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, moving on to the superintendent's report. Thank you, Chairman Zulis. I'd like to ask up our uh, future problem solvers who have been an outstanding audience here tonight uh, with their coaches, Lori Henry, uh, our elementary coach, and Nicole Hoysianos from the PS Middle School. So... Uh, Nicole and Lori are going to take the lead. We'd like to have all our future problem solvers, maybe if they uh, could come around to the other side of the table. <laughs> so here's a little secret. We have never had a group of students this large in attendance <laughs> uh, to be recognized, but we're very, very proud uh, to have our future problem solvers here tonight. Perhaps does one uh, row, Miss Henry, want to get want to sit on the ground, mm -hmm. on the rug? Lori, Lori, take care of that. Want to go over and take care of that for them? Thank Wonderful. You so, much. so welcome, welcome, boys and girls, students. Uh, Lori, do you want to begin yes. with the introductions? Um, I think is it okay if everyone introduces themselves? But they'd love to just say their names. Yeah, would that be okay, Jim? Sure. Okay, great, and we'll just pass. Just, what's your name? Hi, my name is De'Aaron Jones, and I'm from Tucker. Hi, my name is Tracy, and I'm from Collicott. Hi, my name is Henry, and I'm from Tucker. First and last name. Hi, my name is Mary Mylod. I'm from Cunningham Elementary. Hi, my name is Anna Hamblet, and I'm from Cunningham. Hi, my name is Liam Goodman, and I'm from, and I'm from Cunningham Elementary. Hi, my name is Baron Clancy, and I'm from Cunningham Elementary. Hi, my name is Eden Humphreys. I'm from Collicott Elementary School. Hi, my name is Eliana G. Baptiste, and I'm from Tucker Elementary. Hi, my name is Ketchi Yaranyaruka, and I'm from Tucker Elementary School. Hi, my name is Max Hongs with Hayes, and I'm from Tucker Elementary School. Hi, I'm Peter Rui, and I'm from Tucker Elementary School. Hi, I'm Claire Walco, and I'm from Pierce. Hi, I'm Anderson Coleman from Cunningham Elementary School. Hi, I'm Alex Benoit from Pierce. Hi, I'm Zoe Maloof from Pierce. Hi, I'm Jean Panera from Pierce. Hi, I'm Dominique Thomas from Pierce. Hi, I'm Tyler Kennedy from Collicut. Hi, I'm Aurora Buchal from Glover. Hi, I'm Happy Blasdale, and I'm from Glover. Hi, I'm Lila Glenn, and I'm from Collicott. Hi, I'm Caroline Gannon, and, and I'm from Cunningham. Hi. Hi, I'm Ian Lundin, and I'm from Glover. Hi. <coughs> Hi, I'm Chris Barrett, and I'm from Glover. Hi, I'm Jonathan Waldman, and I'm from Collicott. Nicole Hoysianels, the PR's Future Problem Solvers Coach. Thank you so much <laughs> for having us tonight to school committee. Um, Lori, you didn't introduce yourself. Yeah. Laurie Henry. I'm Laurie Henry, the elementary school librarian and future problem solving coach for the elementary schools. And um, we're so happy uh, to be here tonight. The future problem solving teams have been researching challenging topics this year that included the impact of social media, processed food, propaganda and enhancing human potential. And on February 28th, the quali um, qualifying bowls were held across the state. 13 teams from Milton competed in the qualifying bowl in Canton, <coughs> at Canton High School, and each team spent two hours using the six-step future problem-solving process to tackle a challenge set in the future on the topic of propaganda. And uh, Peter and Anderson are going to give you a little um, uh, background on the topic. The topic for the qualifying bowl was propaganda. 
Propaganda is the communication aimed at influencing the attitude of a community towards some cause or position. Selective messages are used to produce an emotional rather than rational response from the audience. Common media for transmitting propaganda messages include news reports, government reports, historical revision, junk science, books, leaflets, movies, radio, television, and posters. Propaganda shares techniques with advertising and public relations. Some of the questions we considered were growing trends in communication. How will propaganda be spread in the future through digital media? How can wealth of individuals, groups, or countries advance a particular agenda? In a number of regional and global conflicts, including both World Wars, the Korean and Vietnam Wars, the Balkan conflict, and more recently, the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, propaganda has more typically referred to political or nationalist uses of these techniques. Examples of these techniques include the following. Instilling panic, appealing to prejudice, creating a bandwagon, demonizing the enemy, stating half-truth, providing a scapegoat. Propaganda usually exists on both sides of a conflict, but is often perceived as negative in nature. So based on the results of the qualifying bowl, teams from Glover, Cunningham, and Pierce were invited to the State Bowl at Mass Maritime Academy on April 11th. And we were able to send an individual from each team that wasn't invited. So eight individuals competed as well. And the topic of the State Bowl was enhancing human potential. So Tyler and Aurora are going to give you a little background on that topic. The topic for the State Bowl was enhancing human potential. Through the, the, through the use of performance enhancing drugs, personal training, speed enhancing swimsuits, technologies for body and brain, people can enhance their potential on physical, emotional, and cognitive abilities. As times go on, humans will be offered even more ways to enhance their potential in unprecedented ways. Cybernetic body parts, memory enhancing or erasing drugs, technology, advanced sports equipment, and or human in computer face interfaces. Some of the questions we considered were, will the definition of human change? Many ethical issues surrounded these advances. Should sports people be able to enhance their performances in any way they like? Should parents be able to choose IQ or mood boosters such as drugs or brain implants for their children? What impacts might exist with the disparities between the haves and the have-nots? How far might the human, human brain and body be pushed? To what extent can we perfect the human body? What enhancers do we have presently? What are the dangers as well as benefits for powerful new technologies that might radically change the lives of human beings? <coughs> um, so I'm so proud to report that at the State Bowl on this very challenging topic of enhancing human potential, the Pierce team of Dominique Thomas, Claire Walco, and Zoe Maloof came in second in the state. <laughs> and the Cunningham team of Anderson Corman, Anna Hamlet, Baron Clancy, and Mary Kate Mylod earned third place. Additionally, the Pierce team, joined by June Padera and Alex Benoit, earned first place in the action plan presentation. <laughs> and Holly Cott's own Tyler Kennedy came in second in the state in the individual competition. Wow. <laughs> so was an extraordinary year for Milton's future problem solving program and all of our students and we're so very proud of each and every one of them. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Any questions? And Roy? So kids, I want you to know that we are very, very, very proud of you. And there are some things that you do in life that are fun, and that's a good thing. And then there are other things that you do in life like this, 
that will serve you well for the rest of your life. So the ability to think critically, the ability to be fast on your feet in terms of problem solving is a lifelong skill that will serve you well. And we're really proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you. Ms. Varela? Yep. Um, could you tell us and the viewers at home too um, how many times you meet, you know, a week with future problem solvers and how you prepare a little bit? Maybe one or two. Yeah. Well, usually we meet on Mondays, mm -hmm. and it's like during our recess and our lunch time, so we take off that time, and then we like go through the lessons that we would be going through, like towards the meet that it's coming up. <laughs> Sometimes, if we don't haven't met in a little while or something, we would meet on maybe a Wednesday or something like that. Yeah, and um, we would talk about the discussion. We would talk about what we talked about on Monday, but just add more detail and learn about a little more. <laughs> um, the Cunningham Elementary School meets on Wednesdays during the lunch and recess, but if there's usually a meet coming up, like for the um, qualifying bill, we would meet on a Thursday to do a simulation. So we'd miss part of school we'd go at like 10 55 11 to do a two-hour simulation with um <coughs> our teams there are eight people and you get to split into two groups two groups of four and the practice problem was on propaganda for for the um qualifying bowl right that's right <laughs> Uh, any, anyone else or oh well uh, people uh, you, you can go ahead if Pierce. people want to speak um the Pierce middle school meets after school on Mondays and we did also do a stimulation um for the qualifying bowl on propaganda um and we met for two hours in the library and we sat down and did um basically what we would do in competition and that was definitely helpful <laughs> in the qualifying bowl <laughs> For Pierce, um, we can only do it after school is on Monday because Mrs. H is a science teacher, so it's much harder. So usually when we're preparing for a competition, we have to rely on each other to study. <laughs> <laughs> so, or else it really does not work out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Questions? Or are we all set? Yeah. Um, I, I just want to say uh, congratulations to all the participants and uh, also want to thank uh, the, um, the staff and the instructors, uh, Lori, um, Lori Henry and uh, one of our MFE Teachers of the Year, Nicole uh, Hoysianos. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'd like to invite to uh, the school committee table our Massachusetts Regional Science and Engineer Jaring uh, finalists from the PS School, and Dr. Karen Spaulding and our Science Curriculum Coordinator, Christy Chapetta, and their Science Fair projects. And it's going to be um, a special treat tonight for the school committee. <laughs> So while the PS group is coming forward, if I might tell the viewing public, with the, at the elementary level, our principals, teachers, and Bernadette Moonen have created um, an atmosphere and a climate around science fairs. So, uh, so much participation that in some schools they have a primary and an intermediate uh, science fair. So I want to applaud the PS school for uh, creating a climate around science fairs. Uh, Ms. Gormley has gone to the Future Problem Solving Bowl at MIT, and on the same day from across the state, high school students compete in the science fair. And so you have to develop a culture around science fairs and science fair projects. And I want to applaud the PS School and uh, these three PS students who will introduce themselves 
for going to the regional finals. Um, just like the future problem solving, uh, they understand uh, the skill of competing and preparing. And they, I heard a rumor that can't wait until next year. And uh, we're looking for you to go to Milton High School and continue that climate and participation and representing your peers in Milton High School and the Milton Public Schools. So I want to applaud you and the peer staff and all of the teachers who have taught you science uh, because you uh, demonstrated uh, your knowledge and your willingness to participate. And just like the future problem solvers after school, the time you gave and the love you have of science. So before we begin. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Spalding. And Thank you for having us tonight. Um, I'm Christy Chapetta, the Middle School Science Coordinator. Um, we had an incredible science fair this year at the Pierce. It exceeded our highest expectations. We had over 100 students participating. And throughout the course of the evening, Dr. Spalding and I estimated probably over 300 parents and community members streaming through to talk with students and um, check out projects and talk with each other about what's going on in school. It was an, overall, it was a great night. We had to sort of kick people out at the end. There were so many people there. Um, we were also fortunate this year to have John Diamond and the high school robotics team come and put on a demonstration for students in the hallway outside of the science fair. It was really exciting to see a lot of our elementary students um, coming up and having fun engaging in science at the middle school. Um, it was a lot of those students are doing the Lego robotics um, in their STEM classes and it was really great to see them experimenting with the high school kids in their robot in their robot. Um, it was such a successful evening that we're already thinking about how we will do this differently next year to be able to spread out and accommodate even more projects, anticipating um, a lot of our sixth grade students who participated this year per wanting to participate again next year in the seventh grade. With me um, and Dr. Spalding, we have our winners for the Pierce Science Fair, and we were fortunate that all three of them represented our school and our district at the Regional Science Fair the South Shore region um, at Regis College in May. We're incredibly proud, and if we could have you each share, tell us your name and share your project, the question that, that you researched with the group, that would be wonderful. Um, hello, I'm Luke Balte, and I did my project on leaves and giving extra carbon dioxide to plants. My question was, how does excess carbon dioxide positive or how does excess carbon dioxide impact plant growth thank you uh, my name is wallace heller and i did what's the best way to disinfect a toothbrush and so the purpose of my project was to find out what's the best way to disinfect a toothbrush using hydrogen peroxide ice water hot water um, a uv toothbrush cleaner and antibacterial soap thank you <laughs> hi i'm anna Fay. And um, my project question was, how is the air inside a football affected by the temperature outside of <laughs> <the> football? <laughs> yeah, which, as you can probably guess, was about deflate gate. But this, yeah, this was before they got all the evidence. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's basically the scientific explanation for it, if there wasn't any evidence, of course. <laughs> I just want to say how proud, um, hopefully by now the entire community knows um, how much science means to me and science education. And I am so proud of these three. Um, the minor detail that Mrs. Chapetta left out about Science Fair night um, was the fog machine that might have tripped the fire alarms. Um, so I do want to thank the um, town of Milton's emergency personnel for responding that evening um, because they were a little busy elsewhere as well. Um, so we do appreciate that true community effort um, in the name of science and we will not be having any more fog machines at science fair i can guarantee <laughs> that um, but i am so proud of these three as well as all of the students that participated and the teachers who supported them um, and absolutely the family members at home um, who had um, petri dishes probably on their kitchen counters and and footballs um, all around and plants growing and in different corners of the house and um, it's really a full effort and we greatly appreciate all of that uh, support and most especially Mrs. Chapetta for coordinating the effort because um, these are the experiences that lead to careers in the science um, and other STEM fields absolutely 
So we had a little surprise arrive at the Pierce School today. We had ordered some trophies for our science fair winners, um, and we were very fortunate that they showed up this afternoon in the office. So it'd be great if we could distribute them right now. <laughs> Engraved and all. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, does anyone have a comment or question? Ms. Badera? Um, Anna has Tom Brady's defense team contact <laughs> you about needing help for his defense <laughs> at all. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> the mic? You want to give her the mic? Yes. Uh, this is important. Yes. <laughs> He's going to need this. Yeah. <laughs> Tom Brady's defense team contacted you with to ask you for help with your information, with your oh, data results? Um, I have to say, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right on the so horizon. <laughs> I, before they got the evidence, I really was debating whether whether or not to actually write a letter. <sighs> but right as I was debating, because we had a discussion in writing class about it, then oh, that was the day that they found the text messages in Tom <laughs> Brady's <laughs> phone. <laughs> so, oh, darn it. <laughs> Only. <laughs> If they hadn't found any evidence, I would have definitely done that. <laughs> <laughs> Still hope. <laughs> so I actually have a question for each of you. So um, what was the answer on the CO2 question? Um, it turns out that the carbon dioxide did make the plants grow larger, and the leaves were larger, the stem was thicker, there were more plants. And actually, um, under a microscope, I saw that there was more and bigger stomata on the leaves. Did you have a percentage of growth that it, was it 10% more? Yeah, 20 well, um, like the height, the carbon dioxide plants were actually smaller, but then they had l much larger leaves and more sprouts and the stems were thicker. Yeah. Nice job. So Wallace, um, my, I have a question for you, but your sister was here last meeting, so this is your night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the answer on the toothbrush? Um, so hot water at 170 degrees Fahrenheit worked the best, as you can see in the petri dishes to the, uh, the bottom left-hand corner, um, corner. In the after plate, there's uh, no bacteria. So th thank Good you. Good to know. Um, well... You, you haven't heard my question. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've actually read the Wells report. That's the guy that did the investigation. <laughs> the did, you, did you find that your conclusion, do you know what they concluded? Did your conclusions match up with theirs, or did you find different data? Um, well, I did, I, well, go. Oh, I d pumped up my footballs to a lower degree than theirs were originally, mm -hmm. and then I put it in a colder place, an ice cooler, mm -hmm. and the pressure decreased. And when I put it, uh, the footballs in a warmer place and on a radiator, space heater, uh, the pressure increased. So the answer to my question would be, as the temperature increases, so does the pressure, and as it decreases, so does the pressure. Great. Thanks. Nice job, all of you. Dr. Donahue. Uh, <coughs> so um, I just wanted to say uh, I think these are great, great uh, ideas. And um, I wanted to comment that the, the understanding of the scientific process will, will take you far in life. And I, I hope you uh, pursue that. And I hope you internalize the, the concept of, of presenting a hypothesis and developing a control group and, and seeing where the results lead you. And uh, my comment to you is that the, the really fun part of science is when you get results that you don't expect, and then where you follow where those take you. So uh, congratulations all, and uh, excellent, excellent projects. Well, congratulations to each of you, and, uh, and thank you once again for representing the school system so well. Thank you for your support of science and for having us here tonight. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, next, I'd like to ask to join us at the school committee table. This was the res uh, this visit from, again, our elementary librarian, Lori Henry, and Milton Public School librarian, Sarah Turok. And uh, this uh, partnership began. Sarah and Lori will share how the partnership began. Um, I, I believe uh, we have a uh, Milton Library Foundation uh, person and our chairperson, Mike Zulis, and who initiated this partnership at the last meeting. Uh, uh, Leroy Walker asked for an update on our plan to uh, have every Milton Public School child have a library card, but this partnership is more than even the library card, so I want to welcome you here tonight. I think it's important for the school committee and the viewing public to see the partnership we have and to hear the benefits. So welcome and thank you. Milton Public Library and the Milton Public Schools continue to collaborate in so many areas, um, and among them, the, the library card drive. Um, Sarah Chog and I will start with uh, some of our latest initiatives, and um, we held five kindergarten assemblies in March in all four elementary schools to promote the Milton Public Library's virtual and physical resources and encourage our kindergarten students to have a Milton Public Library card. Sure, sure. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Trogue from the Milton Public Library. I thank you for letting me be part of the Lori Henry show this evening. <laughs> um, the kindergarten assemblies that we did this year made a very uh, strong impact on Milton kindergartners. You may remember, uh, those of you who heard us speak about this last year, that at the visits that I make to elementary schoolers, um, I normally distribute library card applications. I also distribute flyers about the library and a coupon which each child can bring to the library in exchange for a prize. On average, the library gives out about 15 to 20 library cards to children in Milton each month. During the month of March, after we did, did these visits, uh, we gave out 106 library cards to kindergartners. Those were the kindergartners that didn't already have cards. And we also redeemed 111 prize coupons. So I think it's safe to say kindergartners are excited about the public library. Um, the second initiative that we want to tell you about um, is the fourth grade book clubs that I have been doing in the schools. Um, I see the kids when they're in kindergarten, but I want to um, find ways to see kids again after the kindergarten visits and remind them of the role that the Milton Public Library can play in their um, academic and recreational lives. So. Uh, one way that I thought of to do that was to do in-school book clubs. I piloted this program this year with fourth graders at two schools, Tucker and Collicott. I visited their schools once a week over a five-week period during their lunchtime. Students signed up in advance and gave up their recess, which is a big deal when you're in fourth grade, to participate. And so while the students ate their lunch, I read this book right here, which I've had the pleasure of reading three times this year. Uh, it is called Alvin Ho, Allergic to Girls, School, and Other Scary Things by Lenore Look. It's the first, um, it's a very funny book that was very popular with the students. It is um, a lesser known series that now is gaining some notoriety in Milton. And it's the first in a six book series with the idea that, get them going with this one, and maybe they might like to follow the character on. Uh, we had 13 kids from Tucker sign up and participate. We had 24 from Collicott. Cunningham and Glover are both interested in participating in this program as well, and we are planning to do that in the fall. Uh, Sarah and I are also uh, working with the curriculum coordinators and Marty McKenna, Milton's outreach coordinator, to collaborate on our summer reading program. The Milton Public Schools will be adopting the Milton Public Library Summer Reading Challenge as our own, and in the process we'll be plugging for everyone to have a Milton Public Library card if they don't already have one, and to use the library on a regular basis. Um, and this is sort of the backstory to that. The reason that we um, want to partner so closely um, with the Summer Reading Challenge is uh, 
I think you probably know that libraries like the Milton Public Library have been offering summer reading programs since the dawn of time. Uh, and programs like this are so important because they help students combat the, pro the problem of summer slide. Um, the elementary schools in the past have strongly suggested to families that students participate in our program. And to give you a sense of how many students have participated in the summer reading program in past years, last year approximately 200 children registered for our summer reading program. And of those, about 100 actually met the goal of 300 minutes read over the course of the summer. 300 minutes in a summer is 30 minutes a week. That's not a lot. But that's 200 students participating. We all know that there are over 2,000 elementary school students in this town. So in order to boost those numbers and encourage more stu Milton students to read over the summer, we are partnering with the schools to, uh, to make that happen. So um, a summer reading challenge form requiring a parent or guardian's email address will go home in the backpacks by June 1st explaining the summer reading challenge. The forms sh will be returned to the schools by June 5th. Then in library class from June 8th through June 19th, Marty McKenna and I will give an overview of the program to all the students, explain the expectations, and help them to sign up online. Um, details of the program will also be posted on the Milton Public Schools and Milton Public Library websites. And Marty McKenna will work with me and identify families who have not completed the summer reading challenge form and we'll reach out to them on an individual basis to make sure everyone signed up and on that form will be um, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to determine who doesn't have a library card and make sure that they have the application um, and get into the Milton Public Library um, so Moving on to our, yes. <laughs> so we also, uh, Sarah and I have also met with Marty McKenna, Susan Dolan of the Milton Early Childhood Alliance. And